Okay, so thanks a lot for the introduction. So as the title says, I'll talk about a very classical problem, like the research three-body problem. I mean, this problem has been around for more than 100 years, right? Um, especially made popular by the one called Poincaré. Um, in some sense, it is still a benchmark for modern development. So my whole motivation for starting out this project was in some sense to try to take modern techniques from contact and symplectic geometry and try to use them as a very old, very old problem in order to try to extract something new. Um, this is very much work in progress, but I'll try to give you a very brief look into the restricted three body problem. So let me start with the setup then. We start with three objects, right, which call the Earth, the Moon, and the satellite, and they have certain associated masses, and we just leave them there to interact with each other according to Newton's law of gravitation. So this gives us some dynamical system that we're trying to make sense of. Right? There's some classical assumption that, that people have made in the past in order to simplify the situation. You can look at, for example, the restricted case in which you assume that the mass of the satellite is zero. So it's negligible when you compare it to the other two, which we call the primaries, so the Earth and the Moon. There's also the circular case in which we assume that the primaries move in circles around their center of mass, as opposed to the more general situation in which to move in ellipses. This is basically a two-body problem already known to Newton. Um, the planar case is, is when we assume that the satellite moves on the plane containing the Earth and the Moon. So we have some uh, dimensional reduction in the problem. And the spatial case is when we drop the planar assumptions, so now the satellite is allowed to move anywhere it wants to in R3. So the goal for us is to study the motion of the satellite under the influence of the two primaries yeah, in a broadly understood sense. Yeah. So this is a picture for you to remember. So there's the Earth, the Moon, and the satellite, which is doing whatever it's doing. So this is, of course, a Hamiltonian problem. And because of the assumption that we made on the rotating coordinates, we can actually uh, take new coordinates which are rotating with the rotation of the Earth and the Moon in such a way that now they're fixed. And the gain for us, this is a magical uh, fact, is that the Hamiltonian actually becomes autonomous. Uh, and so in particular, it's a conserved quantity of the motion. So you can write it down explicitly, it has some kinetic term, then there's some gravitational potential associated to each of the primaries. And, and the price we pay is the appearance of this last angular momentum term, keeping track of the rotating frame. Uh, so here we usually normalize in such a way that the sum of the masses of the Earth and Moon is one. So you can think of this mu, which is usually the mass ratio, just as the mass of the Moon. Right? The planar problem is precisely when we drop the last two coordinates, which is the flow invariant subset. And there are basically two parameters on the problem, which is mu and the Jacobi constant, which is the total energy of the system. So if you do more theory with respect to this Hamiltonian, you will actually find that there are precisely five critical points, which are classically called the Lagrangian. So L1 up to L5, order according to increasing value of energy. These were already found by Euler and Lagrange, maybe like 300 years ago. So in this picture, I'm graphing the, the values of the energy. Um, so for example, we have H of L1, which is the lowest uh, critical value. Then you have L2, L3, and so on. There's some symmetry in the, in the picture according to the mu equals one half axis. So the horizontal axis is the mass ratio, vertical axis is the Jacobi constant. At mu equals zero, you have what's called the rotating Kepler problem. So it's just a two-body problem in a rotating frame. Uh, and then there's the fact that as you go to minus infinity in your energy, then you actually, after, re re uh, after some regularization, you recover the honest Kepler problem, the two body problem. So these are like the two integral limit cases. Everything that's below H of L1 is a low energy range, which is especially important for me, as I'll try to explain. So there's also the notion of Hill stability uh, due to Hill, uh, which consists of the following. So you fix the energy uh, at C, and you consider the uh, energy level set sigma C. Um, and then you can also consider the projection to position space. So you map Q and P to Q. Um, the Hill region is just by definition, the projection of the energy level set at C to position space. So the whole point here is to study stability back then when people were trying to understand the stability of the solar system and so on, try to understand which orbits can uh, escape and which ones actually do not. So in, in that vein, this is what the actual Hill re regions look like. Uh, this is a rough picture in the planar situation. So you will find that if C is subcritical, so if it's, if it's in the low energy range, there are precisely three uh, components of the level set. I'm actually only drawing two of them. So one of them projects down to a bounded neighborhood of the Earth, another one to a bounded neighborhood of the Moon, and there's an unbounded component which projects down to uh, an unbounded region which contains infinity. So roughly speaking, if you start near the Earth and you don't have enough energy, you will stay forever near the Earth the same near the moon. And then if you start sufficiently far away, but you also don't have enough energy, then you're one of the good asteroids. So you don't crash against the, the Earth. We don't like bad asteroids. Okay. 
Um, the Hamiltonian, if you look at it, is of course singular at collisions, but if your satellite crashed against the Earth, which means that Q is E, or if it crashed against the Moon, Q equals M, then conservation of energy will tell you that the velocity has to explode at collision, right? If you look at the, the picture before, you know, if you're going to crash against the Earth, then you better shoot off to infinity in the final direction. So the levels are actually not compact. But luckily for us mathematicians, I mean, engineers, of course, is a terrible thing if your satellite crashes against the Earth. I mean, you don't want that. Bit. But we mathematicians don't care too much. So there are ways of dealing with collisions. There, one of them is due to Moser. Roughly speaking, what you're doing is you're taking your energy level set and you're adding some collision locus at infinity. So you close up your, your energy level set. So the picture that you should remember is a collision locus corresponds to P equals infinity. This is the North Pole on S3. Um, and then the planar problem is precisely this vertical S2, which I'm drawing there, which is invariant under the dynamics. And so all your dynamics is happening in this very nice picture. So you need to compactify for near the moon or near the earth, right? You need to choose. Um, and you get some pretty nice compact manifold, and now you can study dynamics in there. So there's a very nice theorem, which in some sense is the starting uh, point for all the contact and like geometry that we can do in this very old problem, which is due to a number of people in the planar case, proved in 2012. It was also generalized in the spatial case more recently in 2019, which roughly speaking says, if your energy is low, then the regularized energy level sets are actually contact manifolds, both near the Earth and the Moon. So let me remind you here, a contact manifold is just a manifold with a maximally non negligible hyperplane distribution. So this was already considered in previous talks by Bahar and uh, Mr. Glick. Um, so the whole point of this theorem is that we can now try to use contact geometry and the modern tools like homomorphic curves of fluid theory and you name it. So this is the general direction that I would like to take. But before I do that, sort of let me tell you a bit about a very rough uh, sort of um, point on the history of this problem, uh, especially about what Poincaré was actually trying to do, right? So this is some dynamical systems. Already people like Poincaré told us that the first thing that you like to try to do is try to understand critical points or sort of closed orbits, right? So in that direction, Poincaré was trying to find closed orbits in the planar problem, and his approach, roughly speaking, may be reduced to two steps. Right? So the first step is finding a global surface of action for the dynamics. So this is just some surface in your three-manifold where the dynamics is happening with the property that it's bound with a collection of closed orbits, and such that if you take any point away from this uh, collection of orbits, then uh, its orbit will come and intersect the interior of the surface in the future and in the past in a transverse way. So if you have such a nice uh, surface, which you can think of as you put your hand and then your hand is big enough that it actually intersects all the orbits, right? Um, you can follow the orbit of every point so you have an associated return. So you start with a point in your surface, you follow the flow, and then at some point you come back. So you can consider, you can map the first starting point to the end point. This is the point of return. So this motivates the second step because by construction, fixed points of the return map correspond to closed orbits or more general periodic points. So if you can prove a fixed point, then you're in business because you found orbits. So this is, of course, a setting for a very famous theorem, the poincaré birkhoff theorem, which says that an area preserving homeomorphism of the annulus that rotates the two boundary components in opposite directions, which is classically called the twist condition, has at least two fixed points. So this gives us two orbits. More generally, there's another version which gives us infinitely many periodic points of arbitrary large period, which came a bit after poincaré and Birkhoff. So the goal for us is to try to take this picture in the planar problem and try to see what it looks like in the spatial problem. So now we, we, we're in high dimensions now. So there's a picture to remember, and there's a disk, imagine that you have a disk-like surface of section, then uh, Brown's translation theorem applies, right? Because the return map preserves area, and then you can hit it with that theorem, and you get fixed points, which means orbits. The same thing with the annulus. If you have a twist condition, you can hit it with Poincaré Birkhoff, and you get periodic points. So this is a very classic heuristics, very beautiful idea. So in order to generalize the situation to high dimensions, I need to introduce the notion of a Kumbhokti composition, which is, was already also considered in the first talk. Um, so in a Kumbhokti composition, an infinite manifold M is just a vibration on the complement of some co-dimension two set manifold B, which trivial on a bundle. And I want that this vibration has a standard form on a color neighborhood of B, namely it's just project down to the angle coordinate or some choice of polar coordinates on, on, the, on the normal direction. So the notation that we usually use is M is just the open book associated to P and P. So P here is a page of the open book, which is the closure of the fiber. And B is the boundary of any page, which is called the binding of the open book. 
And phi is just a moment drumming will just diffeomorphism of phi identity at the back. Picture to remember is this one. So uh, I have a B, which is a self sort of dimension two. And then this looks like as if I took a book to binding as B and I opened it up and then I glued the front lid to the back lid because this is a picture. Okay, so we have a circle family of pages opened up. So, so far, this has been some notion in the world of smooth topology. And now I want to input some dynamical system on top of this. So imagine that we have a flow on my manifold N, and I would want to say that the flow, that the open book is adapted to dynamics if the binding of the open book is invariant and all the orbits are transverse to the interior of every page. So in such a situation, each page becomes what we call a global hypersurface of section, namely it's just a core dimension one submanifold whose boundary is invariant, all the orbits of all points away from the binding meet the interior of every page transversely in the future and past. So this is just some higher dimensional version of the um, global surface section. It's the same definition. So in such a situation, we have a, an associated point that return map appearing to find out the interior of each page. So what does step one in the Poincaré approach look like in, in, in the spatial problems? So this is a theorem that I proved recently with Otto von Kurt, who's in Seoul. Um, so after you compactify your level sets, after you've done Mosul regularization, it turns out, and this holds for any uh, mass mu, uh, that these regularized end of the level sets have an, have an open book of this shape, whose page is a copy of D stars two, and its monodromy is the square of what's called the densidal twist, which is the simple ectomorphism of D stars two. And this open book is adapted to dynamics. Right? So I can write down some vibration such that every page is transferred to the given dynamics. I don't touch the dynamical system, okay? I adapt everything to it. The binding of this open book is precise of the planar problem, so it's invariant under the flow. Uh, so what this term tells is that you reduce the dynamics in the fivefold, which is now a five-dimensional manifold, right, to the study of some return map on a four-dimensional manifold, namely a, sim uh, a simple ectomorphism of these stars. So, I mean, there's a whole different story whether we can actually study these maps in a reasonable way. This uh, the future. So this is a picture. The invariant subset is a planar problem which is a copy of RP3 sitting inside a unit potential bundle of S3. The page of the open book is a copy of D stars 2 and you know, have the dynamics, so you have an associated return map F, which you want to study. So what does step two look like in high dimensions? Now I sort of generalized uh, step one. This is a complete generalization. What is the fixed point theorem in high dimensions? So before I do that, I need to tell you our version of the twist condition in higher dimensions. So uh, formally, is you, you were giving a dual domain, which is some symplectic manifold with an exact symplectic form. The boundary B is now a contact manifold, so it has a contact form uh, associated to it, just a restriction of the primitive with symplectic form. Now you consider a symplectomorphism, that means just preserve the symplectic form. You consider the associated ray vector field of alpha, um, which is basically um, the dynamics associated to the contact form and the Hamiltonian vector field associated to H. The definition that we give is we want to say that F is a Hamiltonian twist map. I can find a possibly friend dependent Hamiltonian H such that, first of all, it's smooth or at least C2. So it has some regularity. The second step uh, is that it generates the, the return map, right? So where C or key phi T, phi T is just the Hamiltonian flow. And the third condition is, this is the twist condition, is that I want to find a smooth function H, which has to be strictly positive, defined on the boundary of my legal domain, such that, well, uh, if I look at the Hamiltonian vector field, I restricted to the boundary, um, this is a positive multiple of the rate dynamics. So where the multiple is precisely this function. All I'm saying is that there is some Hamiltonian isotopy which runs in the positive direction of the rate flow at the boundary. And you should observe this precisely generalized as the classical situation where you consider T stars one, which is the so rotating in the positive direction in both binary components is basically opposite just because of rotation. Okay. So the theorem that I proved with Otto as well in another, another paper, we're calling this a generalized point Kirby-Birkhoff theorem. This is a special case for more general theorem that we proved, which applies for cotangent bundles. So now you have a fiberwise starship domain and some cotangent bundles, some manual M with some assumptions. So this is a global domain. Um, and now you consider a Hamiltonian twist map in the sense that I defined before. So you assume a bunch of things. First one is a technical condition, which I won't tell you about because of time constraints. But the second condition is that all fixed points of F should be isolated. And under this sort of sufficiently mild conditions, then the, the conclusion is that F should have simple interior periodic orbits of arbitrary large P. So this theorem tells you is that if you're able to check these conditions, then you will be able to find plenty of work. Okay. So this is the our sort of proposal for the step two high dimensions. Okay, so let me close with the following remarks. So for step two, we actually haven't been able to check the twist condition 
and the three-body problem. So I know that my map is Hamiltonian, but I don't know if there's a generating Hamiltonian which sort of runs in, in the direction of the wave flow So this is a very, very, actually very subtle thing to check. And it might be very, very hard. There's an alternative approach with perspective on the problem, which by which I associated dynamics on a three sphere, which is a moduli space of homomorphic curves. So my hope is that this dynamics which uh, might, might remember some dynamical information on the original problem. So this is a reduction. So I start with some uh, dynamics on a five-fold. I project it down with some shadow on a three-fold. And I'm hoping that the shadow of my dynamics might see something of what's going on upstairs. So I can tell you a bit more uh, because this will be continued in October 25th during the member school of Kimta. So some shameless self advertising Thank you very much. Have you attacked any of these classical problems like Siegel and Moses, uh, Siegel's theorem that the sun, the moon, and the earth can't collide at the same time? Uh, no. The restricted three body. The restricted three body, but you don't have triple collisions. Right. So because yeah. it, but do you have any attempt at generalizing that? I haven't thought about it, so I, I, I'm not qualified to say. And what, why the three body? It seems that your methods are rather general. What's fair? Well, I mean, what, what are you using that three body and not? Somehow. I'm using a bunch of things. So the Hamiltonian should be first of all time independent for this. Uh, and well, I guess people haven't looked at those examples enough to be able to say they actually have a contact manifold. Uh, it, I, I'm not saying that you cannot. I just don't know. just haven't thought about it. But I mean, but you're mainly trying to create uh, periodic orbits. This one. That that's the first idea? step in the approach. I mean, the first thing that I want to do is to be able to say, okay, they're influencing many orbits. This is the first thing that you want to say. After that, I mean. And are these orbits uh, unsta all unstable? Uh, well, I don't know I, until I have found some of them. I mean, in practice, you know, when people do numerics, right, uh, you get a bunch of them. I mean, of course, you won't be able to say that they're influencing many with a computer, uh, but the many of them are, many of them are actually stable. I mean, they're stable, so you would have some quasi periodic. Neighborhood where you would have some parts of your like. Uh, so you think in terms of KM theory? Yeah. Um, well, yes. I mean, so in a sense, this this term applies very much non perturbatively, right? So I, I didn't say I didn't emphasize it much, but mu is whatever it, it, sure. it wants to be. Yeah. So you should be able to see perturbative dynamics in the open book on the page, and you also should be able to see you know beyond that. But of course, I mean, at this point, I have no idea what the maps can do. So something is very open for exploration. And one of the directions that I want to do is more practical, so I try to use this for actually implementations of space engineering. So, uh, Helmut can say more about this. <laughs> no, but you are talking to somebody in general. I'm, I'm actually talking to an engineer at NASA. But uh, I mean, we are exploring given the first steps and trying to take the theory, Fleur theory and so on, and try to sort of uh, talk to the people who are actually finding the orbits and for example, study bifurcations in them and try to say things. Is that is a control theory too or what? I, yeah, yeah we, have, we still have to introduce a notion of symplectic fuel, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> but I guess we went to discuss and tell me what that even means, uh, but well, we'll, we'll have time. Okay. Let's thank uh,